So uh, joining us for our panel uh, are two uh, other distinguished guests. Uh, first, Dr. Horst Simon, a Deputy Director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, also the Director of the National Energy Research Supercomputing Center. Uh, obviously a longtime supporter of, uh, of supercomputing, high performance computing, uh, and more recently thinking about how some of the more cognitive and brain inspired computing uh, could also augment the HPC work uh, that will continue to advance in the coming decades. And then on the far left is our Jamendra Moda, who we already saw a brief introduction on. He is an IBM fellow, uh, one of the pioneers that we have on cognitive computing within IBM, uh, particularly on the, on the hardware side and thinking about how we translate some of the neural net uh, technology and deep learning into very efficient hardware. Uh, the Chu North chip being uh, the world's largest neural net chip to date uh, that was just demonstrated about a year ago. So each of them come with slightly different perspectives on, on cognitive computing, and they also come from industry, academia, and the government, uh, not by accident. So we wanted to get sort of their view of, of what we think about for brain-inspired computing. So in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right into some questions. Um, so uh, Terry, you talked a lot about how we've already got um, a lot of our inspiration in our neural nets from what we know in the brain. What are some examples of some recent discoveries in the human brain that you think uh, could drastically change our understanding or change where we might go with uh, neural computing? So 99% uh, of all the experiments done in neuroscience are experiments in which uh, you have the subject, could be human or a monkey or some other species, uh, you give them a sensory input and then you train them on some task. They either have to recognize an object or detect it or search for something. But it's basically a uh, reflex. It, sensory input, motor output, sensory input, motor output. A couple of years ago, um, and, 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 and by the way, uh, this with humans using brain imaging. Uh, you, what you do is you uh, have a human, you put them in a magnet, and then you give them some sensory input, and the sensory areas light up, and they make a decision, the motor areas light up, and they figure out in between you know, what happened. Well, when you do those experiments, Typically what you do is you have the subject in the scanner and you say, uh, just rest and you know, we just want to take a baseline here and so uh, five, five minutes of baseline and then you subtract it off to get the difference from you know, the sensory input compared to the baseline. Well, about 10 years ago, Mark Rakel at WashU in St. Louis said, well, what are we subtracting off? Well, it turned out that what people were subtracting off was the most interesting part of the brain. It turns out to be what's called the default network. Now, what's happening in the scanner when the subject is sitting there and resting? Well, they're thinking. They're planning their day, or they're trying to uh, you know, solve a problem or something. Well, that turns out to involve parts of the brain that are active when you're not interacting with the world. And now that's uh, exploded. Now we know that there are about a dozen of these so-called resting states that are part of the operating system of the brain that aren't online when you interact with the world, but they come online when you are sitting there and thinking and planning, and, and that really is, I think, the, the big change in neuroscience now because we can actually see into your brain, we can read your mind when you're actually thinking about things. And that's going to be, could really transform what we can do in science. So, Dermenji, then, from your view, try to translate some of this stuff into hardware. What are some of the advances you've seen that you think uh, are going to So, it, it's interesting the example that Terry used. In fact, that example, I personally played a very important role which is what happened is that as we wanted to build hardware, we wanted to understand the organization of the brain so we can model a new computer architecture. And the way we decided to approach it is we decided to collect 60 years of connectivity data in the primate brain. And we put it together. And as we put together, we created a network that was three times larger than the largest network any neuroscientist had ever created. Now the an experiment that Terry spoke about that Marcus Reichel did is called functional imaging. So no animal is harmed, you just do imaging. Whereas this data is actually structural. Every wire is painstakingly mapped out by actual in physical experimentation. And we got a network with 383 edges, and, uh, uh, vertices, and 6,600 edges. And we got this network, and we started studying it. it was more complex than any network that we had ever encountered. So we applied a technique to it from social networks, which is we start peeling the network. You peel out those nodes that have only degree one, and then you peel out those nodes that have degree two. And the network kept peeling and peeling and peeling. At the very heart of it, we found these two networks that Terry referred to, the task positive and the task negative or the default network. So that was a really remarkable movement because 30 years of imaging in neuroscience 
and 50 years of structural studies came together, and I, as a computer scientist, and never having played with monkeys, except, of course, in India, peanuts. <laughs> but, uh, it was very gratifying. That's good. So, uh, Horst, uh, obviously, you've been a lot on the HPC side, but are interested in what's going on with cognitive computing. What are some of the key attributes you see in cognitive computing or brain-style computing yes. that you find intriguing? Well, Jeff, let me introduce a buzzword that hasn't been used yet, exascale. <laughs> and I know there will be a groaning, and I know, in the audience, but uh, the National Strategic Computing Initiative, which has been just announced, another presidential initiative, is really looking at what do we have to do to scale current computers to make them a thousand times more powerful in about a decade. And this has become a very, very difficult challenge because we have, for about a decade, since about 2004, seen the end of dinar scaling, and consequently, we have seen computers requiring more and more power. So today's top supercomputers run at about 20 megawatts, say. And if we were to scale this by a factor of 1,000, it would be at 20 gigawatts. So that's probably not going to happen. So we have to look at alternate solutions. And if you look at the brain and look at the remarkable effect that the brain is a 20 watt or maybe 100 watt, 20 watt to 100 watt computer, um, we see this one million difference between compute high-end technology today and the human brain. And so you cannot ignore, you can maybe talk away a factor of 100, but you cannot talk away a factor of a million. And so the first question is, are we really going the right direction? And of course, for my colleagues who look at the Exascale Initiative, know that power is the top design constraint in getting a thousand times faster. So whatever we can learn from the brain is uh, important. So in that sense, it's fascinating to see one of the slides in one of Darmendra's talks, which is beautiful, because it shows a diagram which shows how computer technology in the last 40 years uh, has progressed and has gotten more and more power intensive. And where the brain is, is exactly the opposite direction. So I think from the HPC point of view, we have to reverse the direction. Jeff, if you permit me, there's a second argument I would like to make, which is an even more fundamental one, and this is that all the computer industry, everything we do today, including Watson, including Watson, is still a von Neumann architecture. And the von Neumann architecture has a fundamental flaw, and this is that you move data from memory to processing back to memory. And so there are long wires involved, and the bigger the system is, the longer the wires get. So you have tens of meters in big supercomputers today where data sometimes have to travel. The brain is centimeters. And of course, I think the two things are correlated. That is, for shorter distance you have, if you do the processing in memory, if you use an old buzzword, or if you do um, processing on the fly the way it's done in the true north chip, you realize some of those energy savings because data don't have to move. So I would say these are the two things that really should inspire us as we move forward. So Terry, what's your viewpoint? Any other things we should think about in the brain as the key attributes we should be emulating uh, in, in our new architectures? Um, so I introduced uh, the, the uh, idea that um, the brain is a hybrid architecture. It, it's digital in a sense that it uses spikes. But it's analog at the level of integrating information. And, and it takes advantage of imprecise operations. And, and that's really part of what the secret is, is that uh, you don't need eight significant figures, uh, you know, or 16, you double precision. If you want a fast solution that is good enough to get by, which is what the brain is really good at, then you have to deal with that constraint. And it's not, an energy constraint is absolutely essential because that, that's the way that you get around it, is that you don't uh, digitize everything. You just digitize information you need to transfer over a long distance. Now, big, I think, uh, breakthrough is going to come when we figure out how to compute with spikes. It's, it's, a, it's a different architecture, it's a different way of encoding the information and the timing of the spike. And there's a lot of uh, research being done right now which is pointing in a direction that, again, nobody could have predicted. And I'll give you one example. So, you know, learning, the, the, the dogma is in the textbook that you, we learn by changing the strengths of synapses, the connections between the neurons. Well, that's the, the largest number, you know, 10 to the 14th synapses in the brain. So that's a, it's a you know, a, a big chunk of memory. But what they discovered using these imaging techniques is that not just uh, are, do you see changes following learning in the synapses, but you also see changes in what's called 
the white matter. The white matter are the connections, long distance connections that are myelinated. And that is actually half of the cortex is, is the wiring. And, and the, apparently the volume or the myelination or something is changing in the wiring during learning. And what we think is happening is that you're changing the time delays. You're tuning up your network and timing is everything in the brain. Getting the information to the right place at the right time, that I think is the next frontier. And I think that it's going to be the chip, the True North chip is, is really, once we figure this out, how to, how to encode and translate information uh, between different patterns of spikes, I think that's gonna be a major breakthrough. Yeah, actually, that, that's a great segue. So obviously, if you think about the hardware side of it, and something like a True North chip, very low power, able to do amazing things that emulate the brain, where do you see the first applications, the biggest applications of this right now? So, so two aspects, you know, uh, you know, both Horst and Terry spoke about the different nature of the architecture and the different nature of the way the information is encoded in the architecture. And given those two is how we were able to create the chip. You know, the chip is literally a supercomputer the size of a postage stamp and the power of a hearing aid battery. But the price for creating a new architecture, that it requires a new paradigm for thinking about how to program and learn within it in the first place. So what we had to do is we had to imagine how to map deep learning in a way that a programmer can actually map onto the architecture and remove that barrier to open the answer to the applications. So what we did is, you know, we, we, we're taking a two-prong approach. One is that we have spread the chip, you know, via sort of the Raspberry Pi of uh, True North to about 100 people in 30 universities on five continents. So sort of tap into that creativity because IBM is about open innovation. And the second is that we are beginning to think about a lot of applications ourselves, spanning vision, audition, as well as many other sensors like radar, LIDAR, temperature, pressure, analog, noisy, unstructured data. And to give you some typical applications is, you know, think about glasses for the visually impaired with complete onboard processing without need for Wi-Fi that can help them navigate a complex cluttered environment like a guide dog. So it won't stop in the middle of the road saying no Wi-Fi connection and leave the person stranded, right? <laughs> or you can imagine, you know, uh, John Kelly talked about this data at the edge. And it really, if you try to mine this data at the edge in the coming edge of Internet of Things, you'll have 30 billion devices with you know, hun you know, hundreds of sensors per device streaming that data back to a cloud which needs to be done, but on a summary basis. So before that, integrating neuromorphic computing with the sensor so that sensor becomes the computer is going to be the key. Good. So I think that's obviously the, the power advantage in the mobile space becomes really clear. Now, if you think about scaling up to supercomputer sizes, what are some of the problems you see or applications you would see that they want to apply this to to complement HPC? So, so I, was, I was very intrigued by John Kelly's presentation because there is of course, the same thing what we observe in general in the commercial space and many of the engineering and scientific applications happens really at the high-end research as well. That is, all the scientific instruments that we're using are generating data at a unex uh, previously unexperienced rate. And you can start from, uh, since John mentioned dark energy, you can look at things like the dark energy survey and new astronomical observations to what's happening in nanoscience and what's happening in genomics. So all these scientific instruments are producing data because they live still on a Moore's law curve. And we have the data explosion also in scientific app uh, applications. So the same vision that was uh, projected very well in, in the opening keynote talk is true for what's happening in science. That is, we need to understand how we can optimally use the data. Just like we heard about uh, physicians not being able to look at all the uh, imaging from patients, the same thing is true about astronomers not ever, ever being able to look at all the images coming from the sky, or uh, high energy physicists not able to look at all the data coming out of very expensive, very large instruments like the Large Hadron Collider. So I see a great opportunity to use this type of technology scaling it up to the high-end scientific simulation type capability for example, one could think of um, the True North chip being integrated just like an attached processor in a traditional scalable supercomputer and focus on the data analysis analytics type capability. And I think there are huge discoveries that can be made. You 
to make a bold claim, I think somebody who doesn't have that tool by 2025 when the Large Hadron Collider 2 is coming along will not be able to find the equivalent of the Higgs boson, whatever that will be in 2025. That's interesting. So last question before I open up to the audience, um, since we do have a representative here from industry, government, and academia, we all are working together on this. We have a partnership running. How important is that and how do you see we can foster that and, and be most effective advancing the field uh, using this kind of partnership? Uh, Terry, we'll start with you. Well, uh, let's start with the BRAIN initiative. Uh, the explicit goal is to for, form uh, working groups, teams, bringing engineers uh, to work closely with the biologists. The, it's, 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 it's very uh, telling. Uh, there was a meeting that was organized by the Kavli Foundation, very important uh, meeting uh, that got the ball rolling. And it was, uh, they have nanoscience uh, institutes and they have neuroscience institutes. So they brought them together at this meeting in London. And you know, so the meeting went on, the nanoscientists got up and, t and talked about these uh, cool devices that the neuroscientists couldn't even figure out what they were talking about. Neuroscientists would get up and they speak jargon and the nanoscientists couldn't figure out what they were saying. So finally at the very end, one of the, uh, uh, it was George Church actually said, look, neuroscientists, could you tell me what it is that we could do for you that could help you? And Rafa Yusta from Columbia said, if we could record from all the neurons of the brain at the same time, we could figure out how it works. And the nanoscientist said, well, why didn't you ask us? We could do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was an exaggeration, but the point was that the neuroscientists know what the questions are, and then, then the engineers know how to, how to solve problems. And so this is really, I think, uh, this, this kind of partnership has to happen more often. Perfect. Horst? Yeah, actually, I really like the example that Terry just started with the Brain Initiative because it's exactly the perfect example on how computing the national labs and universities have worked together in the past. So if you look through the history of high-performance computing without the lab university industry partnership, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, and just to remind everybody, the U.S. still continues to be the dominating country in terms of leading in high-performance computing exactly because of this unique partnership. As we look forward, actually the Kavli Institute example is exactly the right example uh, to think about how to bring different technologies together. And I think we probably should try to see to bring a larger group together and explore how high-performance computing, the computing infrastructure uh, in, say, the national labs, the academic researchers and industry could actually come to a new understanding on what is possible. And just like the example for the Brain Initiative, this initiative was born out of a small workshop. And so we should remind ourselves that we should probably try to see what can we do bringing to generate the next generation neural neuromorphic computing or cognitive computing initiative. Great. Yeah, so I'll give you a personal example. I mean, everything that we achieved would have absolutely been impossible without partnership with government and um, academia and with other industrial partners. You know, just I, I led the Synapse project, which started with five universities. Professor Philip Wong from Stanford University was one of the, our earliest partners. He's in the audience today. And so Stanford, Cornell, Columbia, Wisconsin, UC all came together. And as we sort of started integrating neuroscience, actually Horst Simon and I did the supercomputing simulations together on supercomputers from Lawrence Livermore National Lab supercomputers. So without the de Department of Energy and their scientists playing the integral role at the right time, we could have not scaled up the notion of the architecture. And then finally, you know, as we are coming to a point where we are beginning to see what the applications could be, you know, universities as well as government agencies are integral. And then, of course, it's, you don't just build one chip, one system, one programming language. You know, we didn't build ENIAC as a civilization and stop. So there's this huge, massive tidal wave coming. And, it's re and the challenge is to re-engineer the entire stack from the materials all the way up to neuroscience. And um, it's just simply impossible, I must say, even with the company of IBM's uh, uh, resources to pull it by ourselves. I think that's very true. Okay, uh, so with that, I'd be happy to open up to the questions from the audience. If people have any questions for any of the people on the, the panel, please. And there's microphones coming. Please wait until it uh, arrives. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen. I work at Stanford, and we're working on a project investigating uh, the boundaries of humanity and the differences between 
humans, non-human animals, and machines. And so from your perspectives, I was wondering, uh, do you think there are any aspects of the human brain or even the human experience that machines ultimately will never be able to replicate or emulate? I want to take that. So uh, first of all, <laughs> whenever someone says never, don't believe them because uh, we, 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 you know, that just means you don't have enough imagination. So uh, I, I, you know, this is a classic question. You know, what is consciousness? Uh, is it different from humans and other animals and so forth? Uh, I actually am a little bit of a maverick here because I think that it's it's not the right question. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I would, actually I was a colleague of Francis Crick for many years, and that was the, one of the big scientific questions in his life that that he tried to uh, approach. Uh, so there was another question that was uh, circulating 100 years ago. What is life? What distinguishes living things from rocks that aren't living, right? And, and other inorganic things. What, what's the difference? A spark of life, what is it? Well, you know, philosophers would argue about this for, you know, uh, years and decades and write books about it and so forth. Well, does anybody ask that question anymore? Well, no, actually, uh, we know about DNA, we know about how cells work, we know there's, there's a lot of mechanisms, it's very complicated. But we don't ask, you know, what is life? We know what life is now, right? You don't ask that question anymore. I think the same thing is going to happen. Once we've understood enough about the principles of how the brain works, the problem of what is consciousness will kind of disappear and it'll be replaced with more specific questions that are relevant to different parts mm -hmm. of the brain. I'd like to answer with, a, with an anecdote that I've told some of you probably before because it really uh, changed my scientific career. And that happened when I was in uh, junior high school. I got a little uh, construction kit which allowed me to build a computer, but that was a very tr primitive computer. It was light bulbs and batteries and switches and wires, and you programmed the computer by uh, reconnecting the wires into different patterns. So that computer, you, I could play tic-tac-toe, but it was very simplistic, and I figured out after about five games how to beat the computer. And then I beat the computer ten times. And here's the key moment. I sat back for about 30 seconds and said, is this computer now upset at me that I won and figured it out? <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, a decisive moment because I wouldn't have probably been a computer scientist if I hadn't had this experience. But after 30 seconds, I said, no, it's just a batch of light bulbs and batteries and switches and wires. And so it won't be angry. And so to answer your question, everything we've discussed here today is nothing more but a scaled up version of batteries and light bulbs and switches and wires. <laughs> There's nothing else. I mean, it's fancier and it's integrated circuits and it's scaled up and much faster, but that's what it is. So I don't think anybody here will ever think that Watson will get upset at losing a game. <laughs> Very good. Any questions? There's one up here too. Um, hi, my name is Neyati and I work as a data scientist with the Watson ecosystem team. Uh, my question is more uh, specific, especially uh, with respect to phantom limb effect. Um, and uh, because cortical reorganization is so varied across different people and phantom limb has so much to do with the psyche of a patient, uh, is there potential for uh, brain-computer interfaces to be used there to also solve the psychological factors that affect patients with strokes and so on and um, are suffering phantom limb? Somebody should ask Watson. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments? Any comments on this? No, I... So uh, I have a startup company called Emotion based on some of the research we had done earlier on neural networks that recognizes facial expressions that are associated with different emotions. And uh, what's surprising is how many applications there are. Uh, the, the, the company uh, is using you know, deep learning and so forth it can now basically take a, a, a video of the audience, and they, they did this, by the way, at one of the presidential debates you know, for the Republicans. And you can track every single person's emotion. It, 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 it actually uses a system called facial action coding, which is every single muscle you can figure out you know, it's, if they're happy or sad, depending on different muscles. But uh, it, it, this is it's a, it's a really you know, a powerful system 
Uh, you can use it in health to determine uh, what patients are actually feeling. Often they don't tell you. They don't even know sometimes what they're feeling. But you know, your face is reflecting the actual brain processing, what, you know, whether you're in pain or whether you're sad and so forth. Um, and it, it's, it's tremendous applications in marketing. You can imagine uh, how you know, people would really like to know how you really like their product, not what you told them in the questionnaire, right? So this is going to be a real-time uh, uh, applications. And, and it, it really gets to the point of, of which I think came up in our discussion last night, which was that uh, humans are not just uh, uh, cognitive machines. They are living, breathing, emotional, his they have a history. They, they love. They hate. I mean, they, they kill each other. Uh, you know, those, those are things that, uh, behaviors that are, uh, you know, not uh, easily understood. Uh, but the fact is that we, we will have that all instrumented. We'll understand so much more about humans. In fact, the, the real turning point for me is not, uh, was not, not 2011, which I think was the date that was uh, kind of the kickoff for Watson. I, th I think the real turning point is when we understand ourselves well enough uh, to be able to start ameliorating some of these behaviors that we have, or which are definitely non-functional in terms of war and, and, and uh, violence and so forth. And uh, that's going to happen within our lifetime. It's, 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 it's really, it's not just building uh, things that work as, like human beings, it's yeah. understanding ourselves. That's yeah. going to be the ultimate breakthrough. That, that sounds great. Questions? Hello, uh, I'm Mushfiq uh, from Oklahoma State University. Uh, so I have a question that uh, why many layers are required to solve some problems. Like, theoretically, one hidden layer is sufficient to approximate any boric integrable function. So is there a theoretical difference between the approximation abilities of a one hidden layer network uh, and a 10 hidden layer network? Question layer networks in, in neural nets. So the, the, is the question is how does the classification accuracy improve as, si as, as the number of neurons in the network improve? Is that what you're asking? Well, I think you said specifically the layers. The layering. Yeah, why is it well, deep? You know, what's, what is the, unpack that. So you, Yoshua is the one okay, that actually yeah. should answer. <laughs> Yoshua, here. <laughs> He's the, one of the world's leading experts. a friend. So, be, hello? Yes? Okay. Uh, there is theory that allows us to understand the additional expressive power that you get from more layers. And basically what the theory says is that um, there are uh, large families of functions that can be represented very compactly with a deep network with many layers. And if you try to represent these functions with a shallow network with not enough layers, then you won't be able to unless you make that shallow network uh, exponentially large. So in other words, um, the, the kinds of computations that require a lot of compositions, because that's what layers mean, um, are not efficiently computable by uh, shallow networks. So it gets back to the whole scaling question. If you want to scale and not be exponential, you need to do some sort of layering at some point. Right, right. So for basically probably a lot of complex problems, we do need deeper networks. That's bottom line. Yeah, I'll just add one uh, thing to it. We have a tool which allows us to visualize data in you know, many thousands of dimensions by actually taking a tour through the high dimensional data and you begin to visualize it. And what we have found is that as you actually feed in a data set into a deep layer network and you visualize it at every layer, the higher up you go, the more spread out the data becomes and more separable it becomes. And that's one of the secrets to why deep layer networks work so well. John Laird from the University of Michigan. Uh, the deep networks are very impressive and the work on Synapse is great but it focuses on only one aspect of the brain, sort of, it's, although it's not f completely feed forward, it's essentially going from the outside to the inside. Um, we know that our brain has many memories and also has working memory, and I was wondering if there is interest um, in the future of looking at the architecture of the brain besides just uh, the feed forward networks, such as work by 
uh, Chris Eliasmith at, uh, on the Spawn system or Randy O'Reilly's uh, Libra system. Yes. Go ahead. So uh, just specifically, uh, uh, <clears throat> the working memory is a good example of that. Uh, working memory is what happens when someone tells you their telephone number or you're working on a problem and you've got to remember two or three things in order to be able to solve the problem. And, and that really depends on recurrence, having connections that are recurrent. Uh, and, and, and so the, the breakthrough with the NLP, uh, when I showed you how it could uh, come up with a caption for a photo, that breakthrough depended on something called uh, long short-term memory, mm -hmm. which was a way to uh, get that recurrence and working memory into the network. And it's absolutely essential if you're doing sequencing, like a sequence of words. You have to remember what you said before in order to be able to say the next word. So, so that is already, uh, that's the hottest thing right now in deep learning is putting memory of uh, working memory into the network and doing that, learning how to do that efficiently. Uh, now, you raise the interesting point, which is that uh, uh, all these feedback connections in the brain, you know, uh, are, are as important for uh, the, the function of our brain as the feed forward. Now, when you learn something and you, it becomes automatized, uh, if the feed forward path is the fastest way there, but if you don't get it right the first time, what happens? Well, you have an error signal. It tells you something went wrong, stop. And now the feedback connections are taking control, right? That's attention, mm -hmm. uh, planning. And that's the part of the most, that's the most difficult part, I think, of understanding the human brain, is understanding uh, how those two things, both the, uh, the fast automatic system integrates with this slow system. And, uh, and you know, this is, Psychologists knew all about this, so you know. You, you, I'm sure you've studied this well, yourself. I'm curious as to whether um, there are plans in, in the Synapse project to go beyond the kind of networks that we're dealing with. I, yeah. I mean, I, my understanding is you guys sort of pivoted at one point more to deep learning. No, actually, that, so what it is is let me let me explain. So the architecture that we have built is fundamentally a neural network. It could be configured as a feed-forward network. It could be configured as a feedback network or as a lateral network. So the algorithms we use to program it are from deep learning. But we also now programmed it with long-term, short-term memory. So essentially, either a recurrent network or a feed-forward network or sort of laterally connected networks can all be implemented with the same efficiency. Now, you know, Horst talked about how the separation of memory and computation plays havoc in the modern architecture. With the recurrent network, it becomes even worse because in a recurrent network, the way we, you know, in, a, in a computer, the way we hide this is by a pipeline. Pipeline only works when you can just keep pushing data at a very fast rate. But a recurrent network fundamentally deals with a changing situation. And that's where actually the mag, the the power and the energy and the speed advantage of neural architectures gets magnified even more. So the challenge going forward in terms of the architecture is already solved, is can we come up with more and more algorithms such as you know, LSTM and the other algorithms to program recurrent networks in an effective, statistically uh, predictable manner? So I have one more question, I think. Either whoever gets the microphone first. <laughs> uh, Peter Friedland representing Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Um, Horst seemed to use the word never um, a little while ago in response to a question. Um, but uh, it was the question about um, you uh, me? a machine <laughs> intelligence, uh, um, a feeling resentment or uh, feelings like that. Yeah. Now, despite that comment, there's a, there does seem to be a growing group of people interested in exploring machine consciousness. In fact, I just visited a center for robot consciousness in Palermo, Sicily. So I was wondering if I get the opinions of the other two panelists about whether um, those sorts of things that we still attribute to humans, uh, whether it's emotion or benevolence, and actually we're funding some research on, uh, on exploring benevolence in uh, machine systems, uh, whether that's another fundamental leap, an impossible one. Um, Terry probably won't think it's impossible. Um, and what it would take to achieve that, or whether, whether it's achievable. Can, can I jump in first? Because I think there's a very important distinction to be made. And let me explain this, uh, say, with this Chinese room experiment, which you're probably familiar with. If you have a box and you put in some English sentence and out of a box comes a Chinese translation and you don't know if in this box, I mean it's a Turing experiment equivalent, sits a person who translates or whether it's a computer program. 
But the question you ask, does this box know Chinese? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, yes, of course, it's functionally translated. Now I'll construct a uh, torture experiment. You have a box, and you build some sensors around it, and you can expose these sensors to torture. You can hit them with hammers or heat them up with a blowtorch or do other bad things. And if you do the right bad thing, the box will say, ow, it hurts. Does this box experience pain? Coffee time discussion, but anyway, <laughs> sorry. Terry? No, go ahead. Uh, all I can say is I'll meditate on it. <laughs> I'll meditate on it so that I can experience my own consciousness. Because it's a finally, you know, consciousness is a very personal phenomenon, right? So at the end of the day, I ca you can't prove that I'm conscious, vice versa. So I think, as John Kelly pointed out very correctly, you know, that's a very fascinating discussion. But at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is we're trying to make the world work better by bringing together many sources of data to, of course, enable businesses, but also to make society safer, human beings more productive, and life a little bit more fun. So it's a more engineering approach. Don't trust consciousness. <laughs> it's, it's very unreliable. And in fact, I think part of, the, yes. part of the reason why AI had so much trouble getting off the ground was that they, they were their intuition came from what they were consciously aware of. There's no reason why nature should have built a brain that was, had, had to know how it worked, right? <laughs> in fact, that'll get in the way of, <laughs> of actually solving problems. Yeah. So I, I think it's over overhyped. So I'd like to thank the panel for raising our consciousness on this topic. <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, let's thank them and we'll go to a break. <laughs> <laughs>